Well, hello and good afternoon. My name is Andrew O'Shaughnessy. I'm the Saunders Director of the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies here at Monticello. And it's my pleasure today to be welcoming another of our visiting fellows, uh, Emily West, who's Professor of American History at the University of Reading in the United Kingdom. Her topic today is enslaved women and the duality of feeding in Monticello and the American South. Uh, Emily is chair of British American 19th century historians. Uh, she's been involved in numerous uh, edited uh, volumes and co contributed uh, uh, articles uh, in 2019, uh, she co-edited Motherhood, Childlessness, and the Care of Children in Atlantic Slave Societies. Please join me in welcoming Emily West. Thank you, and welcome, Emily. Thank you so much for that introduction, Andrew, and thanks everyone for coming along today. Just bear with me while I share my screen. Okay, I hope that everyone can see my first slide here, which is where I want to start really by thanking Monticello for this um, wonderful fellowship opportunity. I've had such a fantastic time here. Everyone's been really friendly and helpful, and it's also been sociable as well, which is nice um, as we're slowly coming out of this dreadful pandemic. Um, Monticello really is a fantastic place to work, and I particularly want to thank Monticello for supporting the work of international scholars for whom researching and traveling around the US can be quite an expensive business. So I very much um, appreciate that and thank you. Here we all are um, on our Monticello tour. Um, there are four of us here at the moment. So today I'm going to be talking about some of the sort of wider research I'm doing, a, a new broader project about feeding under slavery. It draws upon my interests in wet nursing, in infants and adult feeding and eating patterns, and in wider familial relationships among enslaved families. Essentially, I guess I'm seeking to highlight the relationships between the enslaved and enslaved women, sorry, between enslavers and enslaved women in terms of how food was grown, how it was distributed, prepared and eaten, and what these patterns tell us about enslavers' power and women's attempts at agency and resisting the regime. Most of my work fo focuses on the antebellum South, but in seeking to explore some of the issues that I've listed here, I'm also interested in regionality and temporality. For example, how feeding patterns varied among larger and smaller slave holdings and how they changed over time. So Monticello is providing a really interesting case study for me. In many senses, I think my research questions um, might appear pretty conventional, especially here on Monticello. I want to know more about cooking here, about horticultural traditions, about people's gardens. But in other ways, I think maybe my questions are less common. I'm not exploring enslaved cooks who prepared food for the Jefferson family. Um, that's already been covered, for example, by Kelly Fanto Dietz, among others. Nor am I researching the enslaved people who tended Jefferson's experimental garden. Instead, I'm questioning the extent, um, I'm questioning the role played by women in feeding infants, including patterns of wet nursing and women's feeding of other enslaved people, including children and adults, and how people made use of their own gardens, both here at Monticello and elsewhere. There's been an awful lot of research undertaken into enslaved individuals, families, and communities here at Monticello. So right at the start, I just want to say how grateful I am to many of these authors for their foundational work. Um, many, and of course, much of this research took several years, um, far, far longer than I'm here for, of course. Um, so I just want to 
give a little shout out, as people say at the beginning, to um, authors including Lucia Stanton, Susan Kern, Benetia Reed, and Annette Gordon Reed, for example, as well as the archaeological publications, for example, by Diana Crader, by Barbara Heath. I've benefited too from the wisdom of Fraser. Um, Nyman, not sure if I pronounced his name correctly, on um, an archaeological landscape tour. I'm often going to be deferring to the expertise of these um, talented historians and archaeologists of this little mountain as I seek to integrate Mont um, Monticello's history into my wider work. So how enslaved people ate is a subject which I think has been relatively and just relatively overlooked by historians especially how people cooked and ate food, whether this is, for example, individually, within nuclear or extended family groupings, or more collectively. Authors have taken fairly seminal research into what enslaved people ate and their, cook and their methods for preparing food, celebrating African-American food cultures, as well as noting the extent to which these food cultures drew upon native, um, African, and white European influences. To name just a few, we have Jessica Harris, whose Netflix show, of course, I very much enjoyed, especially when they visited Monticello, as well as Anne Boa, Robert Hall, Frederick Opie, and Tony Tipton Martin. Others have written, um, perhaps less positively, of course, about the cultural appropriation of African-American food cultures from slavery onwards, including Michael Twitty, Angela Jill Cooley, Jennifer Jensen Wallach, and Syke A. williams Forson, for example. Um, I'm not suggesting that these lists are all encompassing, but these are the authors who've been inspired me here. Somewhat differently, we have an earlier generation of mostly economic historians who very much dwelled on the, dwelled on the question of whether enslaved people were well fed. Um, it's not long until I did warning quotes, um, mostly by investigating the rationing system. Some of this research is now problematic because it can end up conceptualizing enslavement within dated and racist tropes about good and bad enslavers, while ignoring wider um, structurally racist and sexist power structures that enabled the regime's survival. That said, research by historians of Monticello suggests that enslaved people here probably ate more and better food than other, many others elsewhere. Jefferson's weekly rations were scant, as you can see on the slide here, consisting of, according to Stanton, a peck of cornmeal, that's the equivalent of about two gallons, four salt herrings and half a pound of salt pork or pickled beef each week, although at Tuff Tufton this was sometimes replaced with pigeons. Children received smaller amounts of meat and fish according to their age, and nursing mothers, I'm particularly interested in these women, had an extra peck of cornmeal. However, the ability to supplement diets to sell produce from their own gardens marks out Monticello as a place where enslaved people did not go as hungry as elsewhere. Though, of course, we have to remember that enslaved people's diets were much, much more mundane and more monotonous than those of their enslavers. Enslaved people's gardens, too, have been the subject of considerable research among both historians and archaeologists. Heath notes that archaeology can often provide a way into the everyday lives of the enslaved in the way that um, the records of enslavers simply cannot. Historians have conceptualized gardens as places that enable the development of inform informal economies for trade and barter, allowing enslaved people a degree of autonomy and independence away from the prying eyes of their enslavers, even as they simultaneously shifted the burden of provisioning and providing onto already exhausted enslaved people. So is there anything new to say about enslaved people and food? Well, I think there is. Firstly, recent research into slavery and capitalism means that food can provide a new lens through which to view power, resistance, and enslavers' pursuits of profits. Feeding was crucial to the regime's efficiencies. Slaveholders needed enslaved people to be healthy enough to work, to be sold, and for women to reproduce. Um, Moreover, I think if because women fed other enslaved people as well as white slaveholding families at many times, food placed them at the forefront of conflict with their enslavers, providing them with specific opportunities for resistance, for example, through the illicit distribution of food or through poisoning. 
Jefferson himself recognized relatively early the benefits of enslaved women's duality as both laborers and reproducers that led to multiple forms of gendered exploitation. In the 1790s, he noted that he made 4% profit every year on the birth of black children. An 1819 letter to his overseer, Joel Yancey, proclaimed that a child raised every two years is of more profit than the crop of the best laboring man. By 1820, Jefferson regarded a woman who brings a child every two years as more profitable than the best man of the farm. What she produces is an addition to the capital while his labors disappear in mere consumption. So here, of course, Jefferson's notably failing to acknowledge the fact that women performed working labor and reproductive labor, as well as um, typically gendered chores such as cooking. My project is concerned with women who cooked for the enslaved rather than for enslavers in plantation kitchens. Cooking is a form of gender depression because preparing food in many different contexts has traditionally been regarded as part of a marital contract. Yet women have fed children as well as husbands and as well as many others. Feeding has a duality. It is and it has been both oppressive and meaningful but the power dynamics within slavery further complicated women's relationships with food. Enslavers assigned women with the alleged domestic tasks of feeding the young and sometimes preparing and distributing food to other adults, perhaps all year round in more communal forms of eating, as I'll explore later, alternatively at key, key times of the agricultural season. Enslavers restricted women's attempts to create autonomous cooking and eating patterns, and they sought to impose highly efficient communal feeding regimes to minimize time lost from labor and food waste. My project seeks to show how enslaved women fed others over the course of people's life cycles. And my initial interest here stemmed from a 2016 article I wrote with my former PhD student, Rosie Knight, um, about wet nursing. We argued that white women appropriated enslaved women's breast milk for their own ends, and that the practice represented the literal intersection of enslaved women's labor for slaveholders and their reproductive labor as reproducers. I'm now extending the remit of this work to think about enslaved women's feeding more generally, especially patterns to the weaning and feeding of the young. Of course, most wet nursing undertaken by enslaved women was of white women's babies, but occasionally women also fed other enslaved women's children as well. But wet nursing is an elusive topic to research. Historian Janet Golden referred to it as an untraceable interaction between women, often simply not recorded at all, even though there could have been around 70,000 wet nurses in the US South by the antebellum era. Yet in Monticello and elsewhere, there is limited evidence about enslaved wet nurses available. In a well-known example, and of course we don't have a picture of her, so this is something I took from my Monticello tour, um, Thomas Jefferson bought Ursula Granger in 1773 with her sons at his wife's request, and he later bought her husband George as well. Ursula became a key cook for the Jefferson family and a wet nurse for the Jefferson children. A letter of 1792 indicates that their daughter Martha had been sickly, but recovered with, quote, a good breast of milk from Ursula. Plus Ursula's son Isaac later wrote in his memoirs, as it is pictured here on the slide, how he and Martha, also known as Patsy, nursed at Ursula's breast. Importantly, I believe that more plantation cooks simultaneously served as wet nurses than has hitherto been recognized, although they're often absent in the written archive. Evidence in claims of wet nursing can be partially achieved sometimes through the cross-checking of dates of births for enslaved and white infants. They would usually be born within a couple of years of each other, as Susan Kern notes in her study of Shadwell's enslaved population. And Henry, Henry Win Winchek, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, also employs this method in his book, Master of the Mountain. It's likely that the tragic death of Ursula's infant Archie enabled her to feed Martha, as noted by Annette Gordon-Reed. And because he was born before Martha, maybe it was Ursula's feeding of Martha that deprived Archie of his own necessary nutrition to survive. This really casts a shadow for me over the idea that George and Ursula Granger are privileged people benefiting from their larger allowance of food and clothing. 
We can also think about wet nursing, I think, in different ways, though, in terms of its meaning and resonance, especially for descendants. Isaac Granger knew that he was wet nursed through oral tradition. And Gail Jessup Wright, White, of course, who um, is here at Monticello herself working, in a powerful statement at the start of her book, Reclamation, writes, Ursula's breast milk saved the life of the couple's sickly six-month daughter, Martha, when her mother, also Martha, was unable to nurse her. Were it not for Ursula, I would not be here because the child she saved would become my great grandmother four times over. So wet nursing meant something to her. Jessup White and Kearns also introduced me to another example of wet nursing, this time at Shadwell. Jessup White's four times great grandmother, Kate, was born to a woman named Old Sal, who most likely nursed the infant Jefferson, himself Jessup White's five times great grandfather, of course. He later inherited Old Sal, the mother of Jupiter Evans, Jefferson's enslaved boyhood companion. Jessup White writes at the, start, at the end of her book how generations of co-mingling between the enslaved and the enslaver demonstrated the complexity and bizarre nature of their relationships. Stanton also writes about Jefferson's um, grandson, Francis Wales Epes, who in 1827 purchased 57-year-old Critter Hemmings. His nurse in infancy, and, and she, then he immediately liberated her. Critter's son, um, James, appears to have been born too early for her to wet nurse, um, for, for wet nurse, for Francis to have been wet nursed. But an 1804 letter from Francis's father, John Wales Epes, to Jefferson describes how, retrospectively, while he himself had questioned the actions of, of Francis's nurse, their doctor thought, and I won't read this out in, in full, the milk agreed perfectly well with the child. It was better to continue the nurse and to give her medicine. This in turn, they believed, would help Francis, who subsequently began to grow very fast and became, um, quote, quite fat in consequence. But of course, such white children often grew quite fat at the expense of enslaved infants. So these examples then, sometimes only tentative, show us that how researching wet nursing is complicated. And it's made even more challenging, of course, by the fluidity of the term nurse. It applied to carers of all ages and genders, as well as more specifically to wet nurses. Sometimes we know that enslaved women could not have wet nursed children. Such was the case for Priscilla Hemmings, referred to as a nurse to Jefferson's grandchildren. Viewed in the past through the racist trope of the mammy, including by the former overseer, Edmund Bacon, he described the alleged attachment between Priscilla and the white children who called her mammy. Unusually, Priscilla had no children of her own, performing a role so often assigned to black women, that of other mothering as defined by Patricia Hill Collins. And of course, there's an ultimate irony here in terms of the ways in which enslavers um, simultaneously denigrated black women's mothering abilities at the very same time that they left their own children to be cared, to be raised for, and sometimes even to be suckled by enslaved women. Ultimately, I believe wet nursing allows us to further break down dated and racist tropes such as mammy. Enslaved women domestics within plantation houses were often very young or very old, women who held little value as field laborers, but whom enslavers felt needed to work. They regarded these women and sometimes their spouses and children as privileged. As noted by Krista Dirkscheide in her book about amelioration ideas in slavery, um, Jefferson himself romanticized alleged loyal, improving, productive people by rewarding them with specific job titles. However, in reality, the arduous nature of this labor, coupled with the increased risk of sexual assaults at the hands of white men in plantation homes, means that the domestic, allegedly privileged work of enslaved women has now thankfully been reappraised. We're now moving beyond Mammy, and instead I think we're thinking much more um, in a much more nuanced way about the difficult and complex lives of plantation domestics. Jefferson appears to have been fairly typical in his drive to ensure the maximum labor of his enslaved people at, who worked as nurses. So here's that vague term again, nurses. Um, and here he, I'm thinking about women who cared for, um, and children who cared for white and enslaved infants and children. 
Both Stanton and Heath claim that older women tended to serve as nurses or cooks in the quarters. Um, and this is something I'm going to be moving on to later in the paper. For example, um, Heath mentions a poplar forest um, carer named Old Judy, a mother of three children, according to the Monticello database, who died at the age of 82 in 1810. So she, she lived to a good age. Jefferson's farm book, prescriptive and idealized about how things should be run at Monticello, suggested that enslaved people's homes should be built very near to each other so that fewer nurses may serve and that children may be more easy, easily attended to by the superannuated, i.e. elderly, women. He didn't specify the gender of youngsters required to work as nurses for younger children, often helping these older women, but we do know that at age 10, this is you know, very, very, relatively young, they then moved into more gendered segregate, gender segregated tasks, the boys making nails and the girls spinning on Mulberry Row. Ultimately, though, all these strategies serve to emphasize power, authority, and profit, seeking efficiencies on Monticello, although, the, of course, the latter was not always successful in Jefferson's case. How much did Jefferson himself recognize the value of nutrition in terms of contemporary understandings, of course, for the purposes of reproduction and therefore plantation efficiencies? Um, he did discuss um, these types of concerns in relation to Native American women in his notes from the state of Virginia. I'm slightly mindful here of, you know, I'm um, taking quotes from this work out of context, but I, I think um, both these quotes are relevant here. Um, in writing about Native Americans, he said, with all animals, if the female is badly, if badly fed or not fed at all, her young perish. And if both male and female be reduced to like want, each generation becomes less active less productive. Where food is regularly supplied, a single farm will shoe more of cattle than a whole country of forest can of buffaloes. The same Indian women, when married to white traders, who feed them and their children plentifully and regularly, who exempt them from excessive drudgery, who keep them stationary and unexposed to accident, produce and raise as many children as white women. Similarly, and of course, you know, there are racist ideas here, as we know, but of enslaved people, he wrote, under the mild treatment our slaves experience and their wholesome, though coarse food, this blot on our country increases as fast or faster than the whites. So we need to think about what Jefferson said and what he believed in relation to food, as well as the more often quoted um, example of the blot on the landscape, I think. An easy way for enslavers such as Jefferson to feed children quickly and efficiently was through the deployment of an elderly woman as a cook in the quarters, as I said previously, preparing food and caring for young children, sometimes with the assistance of those slightly older, although here it seems as though they were still under 10 years of age. So these are relative concepts. Stanton writes how Jefferson's grandson, Thomas J. Randolph, remembers a middle-aged woman. Um, again, this is a relative concept, one that I'm particularly sensitive to. Um, cooked for the laborers, she milked the cows, she made butter. But additionally, um, children were brought to her house every morning and she cared for them while their mothers worked, assisted by those old enough to help. So this woman too, she also seems to have um, cooked for adult field laborers as well as children. Um, and the picture here isn't um, an example from Monticello, it's from elsewhere. But I think importantly, um, it's, it's the fact that these cooks in the quarters have mostly remained invisible in enslavers' sources, yet they performed crucial, multifaceted and arduous caring roles, work that's typically gendered. I also want to mention the fact that this woman's nameless in um, the white evidence I've just quoted, and Stanton has a, a simply brilliant line in Those Who Labour for My Happiness, where she describes the domestics at Monticello anonymously passing through the accounts of visitors like shadows, victims of the passive voice. Dinner was served, tea was brought, fires were lighted. The same can be said of the quarter's cooks for whom enslavers had no need to create self-regarding ideological and paternalistic tropes such as the mammy in their efforts to rationalize their exploitation of others. 
Plus, of course, Mammy then fell into early white racist versions of the history of slavery written by former enslavers and lost cause idealists because history is ultimately about power. Quarters cooks remained invisible. Older women cooking for children are more strongly evidenced in later antebellum sources. For example, from those who published their autobiographies or people who were interviewed by the Works Progress Administration in the 1930s, many of whom recalled enslaved children, and of course, many of these respondents were children in slavery times. Um, they recall children being fed communally out of large containers or even troughs. I think the WPA respondents deliberately evoked such animalistic imagery in an almost metaphorical way to convey the harshness of the regime in a way that their mostly white interviewers would find palatable. Children used wooden spoons, shells, or simply their hands to scoop out pot liquor or clabber from these containers. Obviously, this type of food provided an extremely cost-effective way to use up poor quality items and spoiled food, as well as remains that might otherwise have been fed to animals. Enslavers sought to feed at minimal cost. Peter Hatch, in his beautifully presented book, A Rich Spot of Earth, writes about how Indian corn was crucial to Monticello's enslaved population, um, partly for feeding in infants, but also adults as well, as well as for feeding livestock. Um, Jefferson's own experimental garden was devoted to more exotic and unusual varieties of corn. Corn formed a, formed a substantial component of the weekly rationing system, and Jefferson's farm book contains estimates of corn to be distributed to the enslaved, immediately next that to be given to animals. In October 1819, he recommended that corn offal, i.e. bits of sort of castaways and stalks, etc., should be used in all possible cases. Such was the cost of plantation efficiency. While some enslaved women had to deny infants their own breast milk to suckle others, other women were denied the pleasure of providing their offspring with nourishment during the day because their children were eating communally under the care of another woman. There is of course an important duality to all this. Feeding children is often a monotonous and arduous task, but there is a pleasure in nurturing others, especially loved ones. Ultimately, enslavers denied women the ability to make choices here. Children often ate breakfast and their midday dinner, um, the midday meal is called dinner at this time, communally, while Stanton believes mothers and fed children, at least at night, in their own cabins, once the move to family cabins was made in the 1790s. Such a change is important in terms of how we might understand how enslaved adults ate on plantations as was Jefferson's move from tobacco to wheat cultivation in the same decade. In notes from the state of Virginia, Jefferson wrote optimistically about wheat cultivation when compared to tobacco, with the former being a culture productive of infinite wretchedness. Little food of any kind is, kind is raised by them, so that the men and animals on these farms are badly fed and the earth is rapidly impoverished. The cultivation of wheat is the reverse in every circumstance. It feeds the labourers plentifully, requires from them only a moderate toil, except in the season of harvest, raises great numbers of animals for food and service, and diffuses plenty and happiness among the whole. Significantly too, of course, though, wheat was less reliant on children with small hands than tobacco, enabling Jefferson to move children into the production of nails and cloth in his drives for efficiency. However, Krista Dirkscheide claims he was not a competent farmer, for example, he ended up replacing, having to replace, uh, he, he, he replaced some of his corn with wheat, meaning he ended up having to buy expensive barrels of corn from his neighbours, despite all the planning and estimates that he detailed in his farm book. By the antebellum era, enslavers were still debating the relative merits of communal versus familiar forms of eating among their adult enslaved people, and practice varied. Some ate breakfasts in their cabins while others ate none or consumed this in the fields or plantation yards. Dinner at noon was likely to be eaten more communally than other meals made by the elderly quarters cooks, some of whom also prepared food for children, as I mentioned earlier. These women preferred food in a separate kitchen to that where women cooked for white enslavers and people mostly ate one pot food, um, some eaten in shady yards, otherwise at the side of a field. <clears throat> 
I'd like to know more about these practices on Monticello, um, but thus far I've only found evidence of what happened at harvest time. Here Stanton writes that Jefferson segregated workers into um, one gang of men, another gang of women and boys, and that two women in their 60s named Betty and Fanny, they have names, which is great, cooked meals for them. Listed in his farm book as cooks, Jefferson again wrote enthusiastically about how such labour patterns at harvest time would increase efficiencies. And he also um, in permitted an increased ration at harvest time, including some whiskey and molasses. Communal food preparation and consumption hence maximised the time that enslaved people could labour elsewhere, especially at busy times of year, such as busy times of year, such as harvest. Such notions chime with manifestations of power and authority, typically gendered power and authority in other repressive regimes, such as prisons. For example, and I'm not comparing here these regimes as a whole, just in this context, authorities in the early Soviet Union, I went down a bit of a wormhole with this, so bear with me, waged a battle against what they disparagingly termed private kitchens as reactionary and backward looking, keeping women away from the labor force and condemning them to the inefficient preparation of food that failed to prioritize best nutrition. Although their efforts, ultimately failed because people wanted to cook for their families. Enslavers likewise sought efficiencies through women's collective food preparation and consumption, maintaining gendered assumptions about women's roles and burdening them with a more onerous workload than they did men. Enslavers hence tried to frame the ability to cook for one's own, own family at night as a privilege in keeping with their paternalistic ideology. By the antebellum era, most enslaved people ate these evening meals known as supper within family groups, sometimes smaller and nuclear, at other times more extended. Although prescriptive journals about so-called slave management never agreed on a preferable model for eating. An unnamed Virginia author wrote in 1837 that their food should be cooked for them twice a day and carried out to the field. It is the general custom in this part of the state, and I'm afraid I don't know which part this is, that enslaved people, sorry, that to have their food cooked but once a day and to require each enslaved person to cook for himself at night and carry with him his food for the morning's meal in the field. And note here, of course, the male pronoun, even though we know that it's women who cook. Evening meals in the quarters therefore represented both a concession to food autonomy and a simultaneous shifting of responsibility for nourishment onto exhausted enslaved women by enslavers, again exposing another duality of feeding. Evening meals eaten in the quarters, um, oh, sorry, sorry, bear with me. Um, Jefferson's mood move away from barrack style accommodation um, to familial cabins enables families to better cook for themselves as did the existence of enslaved people's gardens, which I'll come on to shortly. Plus, of course, living in family groupings increased opportunities for reproduction and hence more valuable children. Jefferson actively encouraged this, for example, by giving his enslaved women pots upon marriage. Barbara Heath argues that Jefferson made his pot distribution, only made a pot distribution to women who married within their community at Poplar Forest, conveying his desire for control as well as reproduction. And Hatch writes that the pots illuminated enslaved people's evening garden work because they lit animal fat within them. Archaeological work at Monticello by Diana Crader revealed butchery marks which suggested pork was cooked in one pot meals um, within these pots and cooked so thoroughly that the meat fell off the bone. Preparing food in this way meant that um, meals could simply simmer away while women performed their other evening chores, such as tending to children or cleaning or tidying. Root cellars underneath cabins enabled vegetables and other items to be stored away from heat and rain. Cabins had wooden chimneys for cooking and for heat in winter. Stanton suggests women fed their children there at night, Although Jessica Harris, although she's um, admittedly writing more broadly about the South, claims that enslaved people quite understandably preferred to cook outdoors after dark in warmer weather. Enslaved people themselves desired the greater autonomy granted by both the move to cabin style living um, 
and also the ability to cook themselves in the evening. However, the gendered labour involved in more private forms of food preparation by women coming at the end of long, arduous working days and conducted alongside other, other domestic chores should really not be romanticised. Food preparation in, imposed a disproportionate burden upon women. As Josephine Bioku Betts has written about her, about, um, her based on her studies into Gullah communities, Food preparation perpetuates gender inequalities, but also provides women with identity, a source of empowerment, and a means to perpetuate group survival. Food can be oppressive, yet also meaningful. It has a duality. Likewise, writing in a modern context, Lola Olufemi explains how making food and sharing it with loved ones is a source of pleasure, but it can also be boring. It's a demonstration of love, but a labor is needed to make that possible. My early research outside Monticello and in the antebellum era suggests women employed more communal cooking techniques and modes of eating in relation to their evening suppers than has hitherto been assumed. Family structures among enslaved families could be complicated due to sales, hiring out, the system of abroad marriages, voluntary separations and deaths. So enslaved people's cabins might contain extended family units, members of multiple families, lodgers and other single people. These necessarily flexible and adaptable kin networks render typically Western notions of households as unhelpful as a model for conceptualizing how people lived in the quarters at times. Drawing upon the anthropological work of Niara Sudakata in West Africa, she believed that on some larger US plantations, extended kin networks meant that the enslaved lived in bigger familial compounds adjoining intertwined households where people ate together and shared child rearing. Here, the African concept of a hearthhold is also relevant. Situated outdoors and centering a fire for food preparation, hearthholds contained more than one household, often extended family groupings, and within them, multiple women played a central role in controlling the hearth and cooking. Some WPA respondents on larger plantations remembered these more collective forms of eating together outside in the quarters. And it's important to note that these practices arose through, arose through enslaved people's own volition rather than being dictated by enslavers. More tentatively, there may also have been some pre-industrial Western European traditions at play here. For example, cooking bread in large communal ovens because some WPA respondents remembered bread being cooked en masse. Enslaved people's gardens offer us clues about how in, enslaved people cultivated food away from the prying eyes of enslavers, if not always overseers. At Monticello, the enslaved gardens successfully, growing enough to supplement their monotonous rations and to sell produce. As with communal versus familial forms of eating, enslavers' attitudes to gardens varied but they tended to be permitted on larger holdings and by the antebellum era on plantations that utilized a task rather than a gang labor system, although not exclusively so. Jefferson's memorandum book documents transactions with the enslaved, as does the account book of his granddaughter, Anne Carey Randolph. Vegetables, chickens and eggs dominated this trade, according to Gerald Gewalt, along with a few key enslaved people, some of whom collected money for others. They were not allowed to to back to raise tobacco or larger animals such as cattle or hogs, but according to Hatch, they grew everyday staples such as cucumbers, cabbages and potatoes, in contrast to Jefferson's more experimental gourmet varieties. Enslaved men and boys hunted and fished for wild produce. Archaeological work has revealed a possible relationship between gardens and status with more transient communities on Monticello's south side, not gardening as much as those in northern parts. Investing in a garden only made sense if people believed they would be around in the future, not leased out or sold. Um, sadly, for me at least, we know more about what was grown than how gardens were cultivated. We do know that enslaved people worked them at night or on Sundays, their labour sometimes illuminated by fat in pots, as I said earlier. Hatch writes that Jefferson identified just one site as a garden of the enslaved, Abram's Garden or possibly Ned's Garden at Tufton Farm, which is, of course, is where I've been staying, which felt really poignant to me. 
At Monticello, gardens appear to have been individual or familial rather than collective, as noted by the archaeologist Derek Wheeler, who kindly provided me with these images. Plus, the plot, of course, is named for an individual rather than a group, so the clues in the name. Hatch also alludes to a reference after Jefferson's death to the distribution of peach pits, so there would be two or three trees about every cabin, again implying gardens were associated with individual, um, with, with individual or sort of um, families um, rather than more collectively. Cobbles near Elizabeth Hemming's home also suggest the existence of a garden there. According to Heath, there are no written references to enslaved people's gardens at Poplar Forest, but soil chemicals there suggest there could have been a vegetable patch where the enslaved grew produce, or else it might have been tended by the overseer and my fellow fellow, Laura Sandy, who's written the definitive work on overseers, um, might have um, a view here. That said, there are records of Jefferson buying produce such as fruit and vegetables from the enslaved there. So to finish off there, I think um, both my sort of specific research into wet nursing and patterns of feeding more generally can be very elusive topics to research, constrained by archival silences, the priorities and agendas of those who wrote primary sources, and then the subsequent interests of historians, especially earlier generations of male historians, many of whom overlook the gendered dimensions of food production, distribution, preparation, and consumption. Now I think that archivists need to index examples of wet nurses, of cooks who prepared food for the enslaved, and for the, of those who cared for enslaved children where they are found, as do those collating book indexes. The unique lens of food allows us to consider the complex relationships between women, food, and power. Enslavers weave food into their efforts to control through systems of rewards and incentives, as well as delegating labor to enslaved women under the guise of autonomy and independence. And it's true that while women did appreciate the ability to grow their own produce and feed their own families and sometimes wider communities, this simultaneously meant more chores for them to perform in the quarters, in contrast to men and boys whose hunting and fishing enabled more geographic mobility. At the intersection of their gen racial and gendered oppression then, feeding cultures sometimes placed enslaved women in conflict with those who held them in bondage and led to some rather complex attitudes towards feeding itself. So, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Emily. It happens for my sins this morning. I've been reading Peter Hunt's book on uh, Greek and uh, ancient Greek and Roman slavery, uh, which is the perfect book for those of us uh, who look at this topic for making comparisons between the ancient world and another system of slavery uh, and the modern one. And as I was reading it, I was thinking of a very you know, comparatively early book in terms that it was published in the 1960s by the Harvard uh, sociologist Orlando Patterson, which was simply called a sociology of slavery, but based on examples uh, in Jamaica. And I still think it's one of the best books I've read because what he's discussing are all the various strategies and he lays them out uh, in a way that a social scientist might uh, in terms of different strategies. Um, and it's interesting because after he wrote that book by the 90s, uh, the focus had been narrowed. And we purely talked about resistance. Everything had to be resistance and agency. And to some extent, of course, it remains agency, but we've gone back to recognizing many strategies. And of course, as you said in your introduction, this literature has been around a long time, but it seems to me what you're adding here, and that hasn't been around for a long time, is a very new literature on food and hunger. And, uh, you know, combining that and obviously uh, the literature on gender. So one of the questions I would like to ask you, and it's a bit unfair because it's somewhat outside uh, what you specifically were talking about, but I'm always interested in comparisons and contrasts, and especially international comparisons. Um, 
in this case, I'm not going to ask you about the ancient world, which I've had fun reading about, but the Caribbean, because I do remember, and the Caribbean historians don't really get enough credit for just how pioneering they were in slave studies and some of the best early studies, and especially uh, the fact that they were very keen on making international comparisons, uh, you know, partly to put aside this idea that some countries were much worse or better than others. Uh, they generally came to the view that the harshness of a particular system was largely dependent on the proportion of slaves relative to the free population. So demographics were key. And so you actually get more out of, say, comparing uh, uh, you know, 17th century Barbados with uh, 19th century Cuba. Um, so my question to you is, uh, what are, can you talk at all about differences and similarities with the British Caribbean and uh, how the fact that in the British Caribbean, the proportion of enslaved people was so high, although you did by the 19th century have some parallels in places like uh, Mississippi and South Carolina, what is called the Deep South in the ship, uh, in Louisiana, the very proportion of slaves. But in the islands, uh, other than Barbados, in the British islands, you're talking about 90% of the population that, that was enslaved. Thank, thank you so much, Andrew, for, for your yes. thoughts, your wisdom here, and um, for, for the question as well. Um, yeah, I mean, just briefly on sociology, I think um, about 200 years ago, I did um, an A-level sociology, and um, yes. and I've, I've very much been in, inspired by that discipline um, in terms of, you know, think, thinking, of, you know, as you probably guessed, you know, in terms of sort of some of my, um, some of my ideas about sort of family structures and how, how we conceptualise families, for example. So, yes. yes um, it's time to reread Orlando Patterson's work, I think. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for that. And I, I probably... I, it just sort of popped up in my mind earlier yeah, yeah. today, and I just thought, I wonder if younger scholars now read that mm. and just what a good uh, good book it was. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. That's, a, that's a really, a really important point. And I probably yes. asked for the um, asked for the question about. Um, comparisons because I started talking about the Soviet Union. This is just the sort of thing that happens when you work in a history department and you end up having, where you have, well, pre-pandemic, where you'd have sociable lunches and trips to the pub and talking to interesting people. Um, so yeah, I think, um, actually, um, I sp spoke to Fraser Newman a little bit about this on the- um, Fraser on the, Newman, yes. Yeah, Newman, on the, thank you. On the archeology span tour, he, took, he kindly took me on the other day. So yes, there, there are certainly, important comparisons to be made with the Caribbean and I think I should go down that road of exploring them. I have a few articles about gardens, the gardens of enslaved people on the Caribbean, which um, which are sort of sitting in a, well, sitting in a pile on my desktop. Um, <laughs> yeah, if that makes well, sense. The, the literature is voluminous. The, li the, liter uh, the literature is vast. I, I think you'll yeah. find some good yeah. literature. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Laura can tell you we did, uh, you know, a conference on mm. capitalism yeah. and slavery, uh, and you know, there are a number of good. Yeah, yeah, and I, yes. and I and I think in, in some of the some of the work I've done into um, enslaved mothers, you know, that involves a comparative element as well. Um, thinking about um, mothering and other mothering of enslaved women in the Caribbean, in in Brazil, as well as um, as well as in. Um, North America. And I think, I think, you know, gardens are, are really associated with um, large plantations and sort of enslavers who want to sort of have this idea of that they're granting autonomy at the same time, it, it's less work for them because there's less to provide by granting this autonomy. So, it, you know, it, it, ser it serves both purposes. Um, so, so in this sense, I think, yes, there are echoes of um, you know, the task system on the large cotton and rice plantations of um, South Carolina, for example, or some of the larger plantations as they developed in Mississippi, as you mentioned. Um, in, in, you know, in terms of um, sort of, you know, some other 
I guess some um, practices related to feeding, for example, wet nursing um, in the Caribbean is um, you know, really small scale because obviously you have um, you know, most of the um, sort of slaveholding families living, um, you know, living in, in England. So you don't, you don't have that tradition of wet nursing. Whereas in Brazil, um, wet nursing is, much, and um, my colleague Maria Helena Machado from the University of Sao Paulo walks, works on this. She's actually a visiting um, Libyan professor at Reading. You know, wet nursing is way more extensive than it is even in the United States. And it's certainly evidenced more, helped by the um, later date of abolition and the development of photography. But sorry, I'm, I'm straying off your, away from your question. Don't worry, because I, I, I noticed the questions are really coming in fast and furious uh, <laughs> let, let's get to as many of these as possible before the end of the hour uh, john regosta basically asked um you know well how what were the implications uh of the sort of issues you're looking at uh for the post-emancipation era in slave life yeah, free, free. yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a really interesting um, question, John. Um, something I've yet to think about. I'll probably need to think about this when I get to the book's conclusion, won't I? Um, I mean, really, yes. to be honest, that you know, thinking about Monticello, I think I've been going um, earlier in time, sort of out of my antebellum comfort zone, to think about the development of some of these themes. Um, I think probably where more research has been done, so again, I'm deferring to the work of other people, where more work has been done is on the sort of the long-term appropriation of African-American food um, by white Americans. And also there's quite an interesting sort of field of research into um, long-term health implications for, um, for African-Americans um, in the United States, you know, because the fact that of the fact that a lot of this food, you know, it's rich, it's heavy, it's fatty, it's meat and vegetables. And these then develop into culinary traditions, which have um, obviously contributed, although not exclusively so, but, you know, they've played a role in the um, more modern obesity epidemic in the US. So I think there's some interesting work that's been done there, um, but it, it's, it's, um, it's beyond the scope of what I'm doing for this book. So I'm just going to read out Mark Mattis's uh question. He says, wonderful talk, Emily. I was particularly taken by your reading of Jefferson's failure to acknowledge the value of domestic labor, caretaking, manufacture, food raising, cooking, etc., when drawing the contrast between the best man laborer and a 20-year-old childbearing woman. I wonder, can you draw some connections between this blind spot and larger blind spots involving women's labor in the capitalist systems, plantations and otherwise. And I assume he's talking about larger blind spots beyond just Jefferson. Uh, yeah, yes. oh yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it, for me, what's been interesting here, and um, this is one of the reasons why I started thinking about this work, um, and I'm not the only one to do so at all, but you know, um, some of the um, the earlier new historians of cap slavery and capitalism, because of course we can go right back to <laughs> you know, um, you, you know, right back to Eric Williams, um, of course. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's, um, a lot. I think a lot of the people writing about slavery and capitalism in the twenty-first century seem to write about it as if it were new, and it's not. And a lot of what these historians did as well was they ignored the important role of reproduction in the history of slavery and capitalism, and they tended to focus on um, labour and they ignored um, the importance of reproduction and how enslavers thought about reproduction. This is now absolutely being corrected. I mean, obviously, um, Jennifer Morgan's book, um, which has recently been um, nominated for the um, Frederick Douglass Prize, I think I saw today, you know, there's, there's some really, really important work coming out now, um, not just within, um, you know, uh, uh, the United States, but also, you know, throughout the whole of the Atlantic regime, there's a lot of important work being done, um, mostly by women, sadly, women writing about the women, um, you know, as, as a sort of, as a, as a counterbalance to some of this, this historiography, but that, you know, yeah, there is work now, which um, asks, asks us to give due credence to women's reproductive role in the way in which enslavers thought about that. Uh, Laura Sandy has several questions on here. I'm not sure we're going to get to them all, but her first one was, did enslavers link slave breeding to the benefits of usually of using enslaved women who gave birth as well as wet nurses, i.e. is not only increase their economic well-being by increasing the number of enslaved people, but it also benefited the health and well-being of their white household and children. If you've not read it, and I'm sure you have, Krista Dirk Seedy has done a very 
good book on amelioration, a term that was not yeah. in the literature even, uh, yeah. in the secondary literature, uh, as to yeah. how planters, both in wanting to respond to abolitionists and genuinely wanting to be seen to be humane, but also seeing the economic advantages uh, of improving yeah. a lot of uh, the yeah. slaves. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I found, uh, you know, I found um, um, Krista's book incredibly helpful. I think I referenced a couple of her arguments in, in the talk. And yeah, certainly, you know, this, 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 this word amelioration, which is feels sort of quite archaic to us now, you know, it's yes. certainly one that's used at the time that's important. I mean, in, in terms of thinking about health, um, so certainly slaveholders, um, yeah, mm -hmm. they, they, they seek to prioritize um, the health of their own children. And sometimes they, they think that this can be done only through um, supplementing or exclusively moving um, towards using the breast milk of enslaved women. And we might think that this seems a, a bit um, unusual because we also have race, you know, the alleged, the, the, the racism, which means that, you know, is there not a, a distaste for using black women's milk? But actually, the evidence that I found, not since I've been here, but evidence I found in our archives elsewhere, suggests that there's something in the idea of strength, which again, sort of comes back to sort of racist traits about black women's strength. Um, and, you know, the way in which black women allegedly find it, allegedly find it easy to give birth, easy to create milk. Um, again, Jennifer Morgan's work has been foundational here in her article, Some Could Suckle Over Their Shoulder. Um, so certainly um, people seem to believe that it, that um, enslaved women's breast milk will lead to a greater sense of robustness, I guess is the word I'm looking for among infants. And uh, this is another question from Laura, uh, and I can simplify it rather than reading it all out. It's basically, did any of the men and boys uh, ever play a role in the cooking? Uh, uh, you know, if, especially when they start moving into cabins and during special occasions and so forth. I haven't really found many examples of that, to be honest. Um, and since, um, you know, th there's also a significant proportion of enslaved families who, you know, where people live in sort of cross plantation marriages, um, you know, some of which might be defined as um, sort of women centered or women headed, and others that aren't. So it mostly tends to be. Um, mostly tends to be women who perform in these roles. They seem to have been fairly traditional. Um, as we see them, <laughs> it's traditional sort of um, gen gendered roles in the cabins, you know, yes, with men and boys. Um, it being an important part of this sort of ideas of masculinity, protecting, providing, going out bonding and hunting and fishing. And it's the, it's the women who do the cooking. I remember many years ago, the comedian Jay Leno making a joke about how men are invisible in the kitchen. But when it comes to barbecues in the summer, they absolutely take charge from their outside uh, cooking and of course lots of top male chefs it's very typical uh, so we know that it's not just a gender uh, there's nothing predeterminated about this at all thank yes. you so much uh, this has been fun and i'm grateful to our audience as well for a whole number of uh, questions uh, and i look forward to us all getting together for fellows uh, party. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.